Good morning and happy Easter. And I'm so glad that I can say this morning that he is risen. In fact, uh, the early church, when they would greet each other, they would say those words in greeting. They would say, he is risen. And the response would always be, indeed, he is risen. What was that? That was a joyful, triumphant greeting that God's people had in that day. And certainly, we can have that in this day as well. And, well, it should be the focal point of our life. And certainly this day, but not just this day, but every single Sunday, ought to be our Resurrection Sunday. But especially in these days that we live, and what a fitting thing. It is, in my mind at least, that we would celebrate the resurrection during this time. It's not only a reminder that one of these days that we are going to rise again spiritually, but it's also, I think, a reminder that as a nation, I believe we are also going to rise again, not only um, uh, from this pandemic, but also economically. And so, praise the Lord. So glad that I get, again, this opportunity to be able to come into your living room, or on your phone, or your computer, whatever the case may be, and uh, get to uh, preach to you and share with you this wonderful message of Easter. Um, again, I encourage you uh, to be people of prayer. We certainly need it at this time in our nation and also in our church and in, in Christendom. Um, I, pray, I ask you to please pray for our nation. And uh, we need to be praying that God would use this to turn people back to himself. And you know, I've heard of that very thing. I've heard of people getting saved, and I've heard of people that are in their heart and in their mind getting right with God, turning to God. So uh, praise the Lord. There is good that is coming out of this. But also, please pray for our president and for our leaders. And uh, they are making some huge decisions in the coming days and week. In fact, I heard the president make this statement concerning his, that decision that he needs to make about our economy and opening up our economy again. And he said that this will be the biggest and most difficult one he will make in his life. So I believe that's our president's way of saying or even asking us to pray for him. Please pray for him. Pray for God to give him wisdom and for God to give him the guidance that I believe uh, he is seeking. And then if you're watching this video, it is for one of two reasons. Uh, you could not make it to our Easter service that we are having, uh, the drive-in service that we're going to be having, or the weather kept us from having it. So I'm praying that God tomorrow will give us good weather so we'll be able to have our drive-in service. That'll be interesting. I'm excited about it. And of course, the walkers will also be singing. So you uh, uh, pray, of course, and by now it's too late to pray for it. But you pray, or actually, no, it wouldn't be. If you're watching this now, you could be praying for it as you are watching this. So please, I'm just looking forward to everything. And this has been such a unique time. So many different things that we're doing. And I hear so many different things that pastors and churches are doing at this time. And certainly, God has caused us to, to think out of the box. And, uh, and I'm thankful for that. Well, let's get right into the message this morning and take your Bibles and turn over to the book of Acts, chapter number 17, if you would, please. And, um, and if it is your desire to do so, you can stand in your living room, wherever you are, for the reading of God's Word. But Acts chapter 17, and we're going to begin in verse number 1 and read down just a little bit. Acts chapter 17, verse number 1, and the Bible says, Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the Scriptures, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus, whom I preach unto you, is Christ. And some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas, and of the devout Greeks, a great multitude, and of the chief women, not a few. But the Jews, which believed not, moved with envy, took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort, 
and gathered a company and set all the city on an uproar and assaulted the house of Jason and sought to bring them out to the people. And when they found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren unto the rulers of the city, crying, These that have turned the world upside down are come hither also. I want to preach to you this morning on this subject, the blessedness of Easter. The blessedness of Easter. Uh, shall we bow for a word of prayer as we begin? Father, we're thankful for this Easter Sunday, for this wonderful, wonderful celebration, and that Jesus Christ is alive. Jesus Christ is risen, and we preach, Lord, a living Savior. We preach a Savior that is alive and well. And the Bible tells us that He is seated at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for us even, Lord, as I record this video and preach. So please, Lord, take this message. Give me great power, Lord, to witness, to preach of the resurrection. And give me great grace, Lord, to be able to do that. And use it, Lord. Uh, to encourage the saints of God, and, and Lord, to exhort maybe some sinner who has not yet placed Jesus as their personal Savior, received him into their heart and life as their Savior. Lord, maybe today, maybe today, that this would be the day, Lord, of their salvation. And so we thank you, Lord, for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, I pray, amen. I read about a Sunday school teacher who was teaching some five-year-olds in a Sunday school class. And it was Easter Sunday, and that teacher uh, asked the question, does, does anybody know what day this is? And one young girl, little girl, raised her hand, and she excitedly said, it is Easter. And, uh, and, and of course, the, the teacher said, that's great, that's wonderful. And then the teacher asked another question, and the question is, does anybody know what, what, what Easter is all about? And the same girl raised her hand and once again answered and said this. She said, Easter is special because Jesus rose from the dead. And just as that teacher was going to congratulate her and compliment her, she blurted out even more, and she said, but if he sees his shadow, he is going to go back in for seven weeks. Now, I think you would agree that that girl kind of had an understanding of Easter, but she didn't understand it completely. And the truth is, there are a lot of people, and I would even say maybe some, some Christians, who don't really understand completely what Easter is all about. But, the, but you know what? There is a, a wonderful meaning and a, and a blessedness that Easter brings into the life of a child of God. What a blessed, wonderful day Easter is. But unfortunately, like, like many holidays um, that are being smothered and are being forgotten because of of other things that people are putting into these holidays, um, Easter and the truth and the meaning and the blessedness of Easter is being lost. By the way, I learned something this week as I was reading and studying about Easter, that uh, back in uh, A.D. 325 was when uh, Easter actually became a holiday and they, began, they would celebrate that the first Sunday after the full moon of the vernal equinox. Now, if you're like me, I, have no, I had no idea what that meant. But what it means is that is the time when the sun goes, crosses over the equator. Of course, that's when, the, when it starts getting warmer and everything. But when the sun crosses over the equator... And so always after that full moon, it is the very first Sunday that Easter is celebrated. That's why Easter's, the time of Easter is always changing, if you notice that. And so sometime between March 22nd and April 25th, that's when we celebrate Easter. But regardless of of, of when Easter is celebrated, Easter is always a blessed day for us as believers because what we celebrate on Easter is the resurrection. And when you look at the apostles and the disciples preaching in the Bible, 
you find that this was the dominant theme of the preaching back in those early church days. For example, it says in Acts 4, 33, and with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Great power they witness of the resurrection. That means that God had given them the power to influence and to convince people that the resurrection was true. But also great grace, which enabled them, gave them the boldness to stand up and preach the word of God. And to them, the meaning of the, and the message of the resurrection was the, the most important thing. And so we look at Acts chapter 17. And in that chapter, we find Paul is go, has come to Thessalonica. And it says in verse number two, and Paul, and I love this next phrase, as his manner was, went in unto them and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the scriptures. So that means for three weeks, Paul went there to Thessalonica, and this is what Paul often did. He would go to a town or a city. He would go, normally he'd go to a synagogue, or he'd just find some place where people were, and he would just start talking about the Bible, talking about the Word of God, the Old Testament, and he would start witnessing of the resurrection. But I love what it says here. It says, we, and you can look at it, it says that he reasoned with them out of the Scriptures. The word reason means to say thoroughly. So what he did was he just simply began to explain to them and teach them from the Word of God about what Jesus Christ had done, what, what, uh, the fact that Jesus Christ rose again. But I love, look at verse 3. It says, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus whom I preached unto you is Christ. So here's what the method of his reasoning with them was. He opened and he alleged. The word open means he expounded to them the scripture. It means he just explained what the Bible says. You know, that's why I like good Bible preaching. I like sermons that take and teach you the word of God. I, I, have, I tell stories, but the most important thing I do is not tell you stories. The most important thing I do as a preacher is I give to you the word of God. That's what Paul did. So he opened the scriptures to them. He let them see what the Old Testament said. And then the Bible says he alleged, or alleging means to lay alongside. So he describes, he takes other parts of the Bible and he took it and he used it as a commentary to explain other verses in the Bible. So that's what Paul did. And what was he doing? He was just trying to help them to understand what it says in verse number three, as I read a moment ago, that Christ must needs have suffered. He was trying to help them to understand that. And that and risen again from the dead. So he's trying to help them to show them the reason why Jesus died and why Jesus rose again. And that's why he preached to them Jesus Christ. Paul was trying to help them to understand the message of Easter, the message of the resurrection. Now, I understand with Easter, we have Easter eggs, we have Easter candy. By the way, we would have had an Easter egg hunt today if we would have had church. But that's not the message of Easter. Uh, that's not what the big thing about Easter. The big thing about Easter is the resurrection. That is the blessedness of Easter. It is the message of the resurrection. So let's look at three things here concerning the blessedness of Easter. And I hope that it is just that in your heart this morning, a blessed thing in your life. Number one, first thing is about the blessedness of Easter is that it presents a loving Christ. It presents a loving Christ. See, the message of Easter is the good news of the gospel. It is the good news of the gospel. Now, Paul very clearly gives the gospel over there in the book of 1 Corinthians in chapter number 15. I would wonder even if I was asked you, what is the gospel? And you would be shocked at some of the answers that you would get. But Paul gives us the gospel. He explains it in 1 Corinthians 15. Let me just read it to you. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand. So he's talking to saved people there. Then verse number three, he says, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died 
for our sins. Uh, remember what I said? The good news, the message of Easter is the good news of the gospel. The fact that Christ died, I would not consider that good news. But it says he died. Then it says this, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried. I don't necessarily consider that good news either. Jesus died and was buried, but that's a part of the gospel. So he died, he was buried, that's part of the gospel. But listen to the next one. And that he rose again the third day according to to the scriptures. So you see, the resurrection, the fact that Christ arose, that is the good news of the gospel. If it was just Christ died and was buried and stopped there, then there would be no hope there. There would be no blessedness there. There would be no joy in what Jesus had to go through. So we see here the blessedness of a loving Christ. You say, where, where do you see that? We see it back there in Acts chapter 17, where it says that he re reasoned with them and explained to them that Christ died for our sins. That is a wonderful truth. And it is a wonderful truth because that shows us the great love of God. What greater proof that God would love us and does love us than the fact that God sent his only begotten son to die on the cross. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. The death of the cross is Jesus Christ telling us, I love you. John 15, 13, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. No greater expression is what that verse is saying than for somebody to give their life for somebody. And that is exactly what Jesus did. He laid his life down for the entire world, for all of mankind. And that shows, that proves that we have a loving Savior today. Now, unfortunately, sometimes we are guilty of measuring God's love to us in what we have or what is happening in our life. We think, boy, if we get this and we get that, boy, that, that proves God loves me. Or if these good things are happening in my life, that proves God loves me. And, and may I say to you, that, that, that has nothing to do with proving to you that God loves you. What you have doesn't prove that God loves you. Uh, people who don't even know who God is has wonderful things. That has nothing to do with proving. Or what's happening has nothing to do with proving that God loves you. The proof that God loves you is the fact that Jesus went to the cross and died on that cross for our sins. It is the cross that allows us to more clearly understand and comprehend of the love of God. Paul wrote in Ephesians 3.18 that we may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height and to know the love of Christ. My, I love that verse. He's saying this, and I believe that is a picture of the cross. That is a picture of the cross. He's saying the depth. He's saying the cross shows how wide God's love is. That means it covers the entire world. That love shows how long his love is. It is an everlasting, it is an eternal life, love. It shows how deep his love is. His love goes down to the, to the worst sinner, the, the person who's in deepest in sin. And that love is, go, shows how high his love is. That love comes from God in heaven all the way down to sinful man. Oh, though that, what, this love that God showed us on the cross is a wonderful, great love. But but I want you to notice two words that is used in, in um, Acts chapter 17 concerning that love. I want you to first look at that word suffered. I want you to think about that, suffered. And think about the words again, that Christ must needs have suffered. You look up that word in the Greek, and it means great pain, very painful. Or we would put the word excruciating pain. And yet, you know, it's several times in the Bible, it tells us that he suffered. It reminds us that he suffered. It wants us to know that he suffered. Hebrews 13, 12, wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, uh, suffered without the gate. 
That means outside the gates of Jerusalem where Golgotha was. But he suffered, the Bible says, without the gate. 1 Peter 3, 18, for Christ also hath once suffered for sins. In 1 Peter 4, 1, for as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh. See, the death of Christ was one of the great sufferings was one of the great excruciating sufferings of any man that ever lived on this earth. Luke 23, 33 tells us this, And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, listen, there they crucified him. How did he suffer so much, Pastor? They crucified him. Crucifixion, one of the worst ways, the most suffering ways a person would ever die would be through crucifixion. The Romans were expert at making people suffer. And they had learned how to make people suffer expertly. I read a man who, Dr. Truman Davis is his name, and he wrote about the, he studied it and wrote it about it. I want to read to you about the crucifixion. He writes this, Before one was fixed to a cross, they were scourged. This was done with the victim naked, his arms tied to a post above his head. A heavy whip was brought down with full force again and again across the shoulders, back, and legs. At first, the thongs cut through the skin only. Then, as the blows continued, they cut deeper until the half-fainting victim is untied and allowed to slump to the pavement, wet in his own blood. A heavy cross beam was then tied across his shoulders, but in spite of one's effort to walk erect, the weight of the heavy wooden beam, together with the shock produced by copious blood loss, was too much. The victim would, would most always stumble and fall. The rough wood going, gouging into the lacerated skin and muscles of the shoulders. They would try to rise, but in most cases, the human muscles had been pushed beyond their limits. At the site of the execution, the crossbeam was thrown down, and the victim was pushed to the ground, his arms stretched out over the wood. The legionnaire would feel for the depression at the front of the wrist and then drive a heavy, square, wrought iron nail. I, I, I believe the closest thing to that that I could explain would be one of those irons or nails that they put in railroad uh, irons there when they nail them down into the ground so that the train can go over them. That's how big it was. And they would nail that, put that nail through the wrist into the wood. Quickly, he would move to the other side. And the same procedure followed. Then the victim was hauled up and lifted onto the upright post. The left foot would then be pressed backward against the right foot, and with both feet extended, toes pointing down, and the nail, and then a nail would be driven through the arch of each, leaving the kneels, knees moderately fixed. The victim would have then been crucified. As the victim hung on the cross, he would slowly sag down with more weight on the nails in the wrist, sending excruciating pain shooting along his fingers and up his arms to explode in the brain. The nails in the wrists were putting pressure on the median nerves. As the victim would push himself upward to avoid the, the stretching torment, he would have to place his full weight on the nails in his feet. Again, there was the searing agony of the nail tearing through the nerves between the metatarsal bones of the feet. As the arms would fatigue, great waves of cramps would sweep over the muscles, knotting them in, in deep, relentless, throbbing pain. Hanging by the arms, the pectoral muscles would become paralyzed, and the intercostal muscles, which are here and then here, are unable to act because they're, those are the muscles that help you to breathe in and breathe out. Air can be drawn into the lungs, but cannot, it cannot be exhaled. The victim fights to raise himself up in order to get even one short breath. Finally, carbon dioxide builds up in the lungs and in the bloodstream 
and the cramps par and, and, and the cramps partially subside. Spasmodically, the victim is able to push upward to exhale and bring in the life-giving oxygen. The common method of ending a crucifixion was by cura fracture, the breaking of the bones of the legs. This prevented the victim from pushing himself upward. Thus, the tension could not be relieved from the muscles of the chest and rapid suffocation occurred. Then to make doubly sure of the death, the legionnaire drove his lance through the fifth interspace between the ribs, upward through the pericardium and into the heart. Now, in the case of our Lord, they didn't have to do that. They didn't have to break his legs. Or, and they didn't, ha they didn't have to put that spear up there to, to kill him because our Lord died before they had to do that. In fact, over in Psalm 3420, the Bible prophesied that he keepeth all his bones, not one of them is broken. But the point being this, it is a reminder to us that our Lord suffered on that cross, a terrible death. He took our judgment, he took our pain, he took the penalty of our sin, and there was nothing easy about the death that our Lord Jesus Christ went through. And so we find that he suffered a terrible, terrible death. And that's the first word. But the second word is this. And the second word is needs. Notice again that Christ must needs have suffered. The Bible also talks about the fact that he had to die. I've had people say, well, why, did, why didn't just Jesus decide I'm just going to take all their sins? No, sir. Th he needed to die. You go back in the Old Testament, you go back to the sacrificial lamb, and that lamb had to die. That lamb had to be sacrificed. And so Jesus needs suffer. Bible talks about that in Luke chapter 24, verse 7, saying the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified. John 3, 14, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. The word must says this is necessary. This is binding. The death of Jesus Christ, my friend, was absolutely vital for there to be a true gospel, a saving gospel. And then I think of the words that Peter preached on the day of Pentecost. In Acts chapter 2, verse 23, him, talking about Jesus, being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. Did you hear that? Ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. You see, when Jesus died, there was a, there was a divine involvement, but there was also a human involvement. It was the lips of man that said crucify him. It was the hands of man that nailed Jesus to that cross. But it was also God's plan. God planned that all out. God allowed that all to happen. God put, God put that all together. And so we see that God planned all this. In fact, Revelation 13, 8 reminds us that he was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So this was God's plan. This was God's purpose for his son. But it was also man's involvement in this thing. And then someone would say, well, why in the world would God have his own son crucified? Well, I'll tell you what, I'll let the Bible Explain that one to you. Hebrews 9, 22, without the shedding of blood is no remission. The word remission means the cancellation of a debt. John 1, 29, behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Romans 4, 25, who was delivered for our offenses. You getting the picture? Hebrews chapter 9, verse 26, For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world, but now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Hebrews 9, 28, So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. And Romans 5, 12, Wherefore is by one man sin entered in the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. See, the penalty of sin is death. And the only way we could be delivered 
from this penalty of sin, which is death, is our Lord had to die. The death of the Lord Jesus Christ was a must needs death. It was a vital death. It had to take place. He had to die so that we could live and we could not be saved if Jesus Christ had not died in our place. In Strasburg, Pennsylvania, there is a grave of a Civil War soldier. And on that stone is placed not only the name of the soldier and the date of his birth and the date of his death, but these words are also on that headstone. Abraham Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln's substitute. You see, back in the days of the Civil War and all the anguish, all the pain, all the turmoil that had come into our country, Abraham Lincoln realized that there were thousands and thousands of men out there that were dying in the place of other, other Americans. And so Abraham understood, and so he chose one soldier in particular to have on that headstone this, this word, in Abraham Lincoln's substitute, to make him a symbol. And this is what the symbol was, the fact that that soldier, those soldiers who perished on that battlefield were dying that others might live. And when Jesus died on the cross, he died as Joe Grandy's substitute. He died as your substitute. And Jesus Christ died so that we might know the blessedness of life, but also to know the blessedness of Easter. So we see the first reason Easter is such a blessed thing for us. It presents to us a loving Christ. And he is a loving Christ. But not only that, number two, it promotes a living Christ. It promotes a living Christ. Look at verse 3 of Acts 17 again. Opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead. See, Paul didn't just preach that Jesus Christ died. Paul didn't just preach that Jesus Christ was buried. Paul preached to us that Jesus Christ rose again on the third day and he preached not a dead Christ, but he preached a living one, an alive one. Um, I had the privilege to, to go to uh, Ronald Reagan's library twice. And what, what, a, what an experience to go to that library. Beautiful, beautiful there in Simi Valley, up in a hill up there in Simi Valley. And you go there and you go through the museum and you see uh, many of the artifacts and gifts that were given to Ronald Reagan. And you get to see many of the things that Ronald Reagan accomplished. It, when you go through it, it just, there's such a patriot, spirit of patriotism when you go through it and you see it. You have uh, uh, the uh, retired Air Force One plane there and you have the helicopter there. I mean, it, it, it really is. It's exciting. But probably one of the most memorable things there, memorable things there, and one of the reasons why many people go there is that there is a, if you would, there's a, there's a gravesite, a tomb there. And you go there, and in that tomb is the decayed, of course, body of Ronald Reagan. And think about it, people go there to see that. Thousands of people, no doubt, that go there every year to see that tomb because of, of whose body is in that tomb. But I, I want to talk to you about another tomb, too. There's a tomb over in Jerusalem that even more people go to every single year. And the reason why they go to that tomb that is near Jerusalem is not because of the body that is in the tomb, but because of whose body is not in that tomb. Why? Because, when, because Jesus Christ did die and he was buried, but Jesus Christ rose again. And I'm happy to say that that tomb that multitudes of people have gone to and multitudes of people will go to, and they go to it because Jesus not only died, but he rose again from the, tent, from the dead. And when they went and visited that tomb, that, that first Easter morning when they got there, there was an angel there, and the angel said these wonderful words, he is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come, see the place where the Lord lay. That, my friend, is the blessedness of an Easter Sunday. 
Up from the grave he arose, the song says, with a mighty triumph over his foes. That is the blessedness. And may I remind you that when Paul came to Thessalonica, it says he reasoned with them out of the scriptures, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead. Here's what he did. He, he gave to them the promises back in the Old Testament that Jesus Christ, that the Messiah would rise again. And you know what? I think we need to do that. I think we need to not just say Jesus rose again, but I think there are times we need to show people in the Bible that it does say he would rise again. That's so important to not only know what you believe, but to know according to the word of God why you believe it. And that's what Paul did. Paul didn't say, take my word for it. And I would never say to you, take my word for it. My friends, see what the Bible says. Look what the word of God says. That's what Jesus did concerning his own self. When he was walk, walking right after the resurrection along the Emmaus Road, he came up to some men that were walking there. Listen, it says there, and beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. You say, Pastor, what thing? The death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Hey, we, we live in Missouri. We live in what they call the show me state. And you know what? That's what Paul did. Paul showed him. Paul showed him in the word of God that Jesus Christ was prophesied to rise again. Uh, he maybe, he took him over to Psalms 16, verse number 10, where the psalmist prophesied, For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Which means he was put in the grave, but his body didn't see any corruption. Why? Because he rose again. Maybe Paul read to him the story of Jonah. And he read to him over there when Jonah was in the belly of that whale in Jonah 2, 6. And Jonah began to cry out to God. He said, I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. The earth with her bars was about me forever. Yet hast thou brought up my life from corruption, O Lord my God. And then Jesus later on in Matthew 12, 40 said the same way that Jonah was in the belly of the whale three days and three nights and came out of that whale. So me, I will do that. I will be in the belly of death for three days and three nights, but I will rise again. And Jesus in Matthew 20, 18 said, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be betrayed unto the chief priests and unto the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death, and shall deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify him. He's prophesying. And the third day he shall rise again. Paul gave them proof. Jesus had told them before it even happened, this is what would happen. Hey, you ever heard the expression, the proof is in the pudding? And that's, I believe, what Jesus did that, and that's what Paul did. He said, I want to give you proof about this thing. When Jesus rose again, and for 40 days he was with his disciples, teaching them, the Bible says, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Man, I would have loved to have been there. And after he resurrected, and having Jesus teach us about his kingdom, a resurrected Savior, how exciting that must have been. But he said infallible proof. The word infallible means incapable of making mistakes or being wrong. It means undeniable. Listen, the resurrection, my friend, is undeniable. It cannot be denied. It can be ignored, but it cannot be denied. For example, in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul writes, and that he was seen, the resurrected Savior we're talking about here, the living Savior, and he was seen of Cephas, that's Peter. Then of the twelve, after that he was seen, listen, of above 500 brethren at once. Think about it, folks. 500 people at one time saw Jesus alive after he was dead, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. All that means is there's some that are still alive that were there and that saw that. And then it says, and after that, after that he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. 
The proof was there. Infallible, undeniable proof. Listen, Peter saw him and the 12 disciples saw him together and 500 people saw him together. James, his half-brother, saw him. Judas, or rather Judah, his half-brother saw him. In fact, James and Judah didn't believe he was the Messiah while he lived. It wasn't till after he died, was buried, and rose again. Then James believed. And then Ju uh, 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 Judah, be uh, uh, Judah believed. And it's then that they consecrated and they dedicated themselves, not only to have him be their Savior, but they, they served him. James became the first pastor of the church in Jerusalem. Man, the proof is everywhere. Not only in the Word of God, but even in history. And then Paul gave even more proof. He gave himself. He says, and last of all, in verse number 8, he was seen of me also as of one born out of due time. Paul said, I saw him alive. Paul said, he's, I not only saw him alive, but he's living. And he's living in me. Infallible proof. Hey, friend, the blessedness of Easter it's not only that he's a loving Savior, we see that in his death, but we see that he is a living Savior. What a blessed, blessed thing to know that we have a living Savior. Attorney Francis J. Lamb wrote a book entitled The Miracle in Science, in which he subjected the New Testament evidences of Jesus' resurrection to jury tests, questioning each statement as he would in a court of justice, and they were judge and jury were alike determined to discover the absolute truth of the resurrection. After writing 284 pages of an investigation of the resurrection, he writes these words, tested by the standards or and ordeals of jural science by which questions of fact are ascertained and demonstrated in contested questions of right between man and man in courts of justice, the resurrection of Jesus stands a demonstrated fact. I know he uses some long words and some lawyer lar uh, 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 jargon there, but he says when you test it out, like you would if you're going to take a case before a judge, it's proof. There's plenty of proof to prove that the resurrection truly did happen. John Singleton Copley, one of the greatest legal minds in British history, three times High Chancellor of England, wrote this, I know pretty well what evidence is. And I tell you, such evidence as that for the resurrection has never broken down yet. Oh, amen to that. But I can give you even better proof than that. And the proof is this man preaching to you right now. May 6, 1979, I accepted Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. And on that day, he saved me. On that day, he forgave me. On that day, he changed me. And his life and his power and, uh, and the force of the Holy Spirit of God has been working in my life ever since. Praise God. The as far as I'm concerned, if I didn't have any of those proofs, I know that is proof. The proof that he's living in my heart today. It was 1932, it was Easter Sunday. A man who not only was a preacher, but also was a, was a, a, a songwriter. A man who had gone and studied music for several years. His name was Alfred H. Ackley. And one Sunday morning, actually prior to that, there was a Jewish uh, man that came up to him to some, some day and he said, why should I celebrate a dead Jew? And then not, and that was just before Easter. And then that Easter morning as he got up, he was listening to the radio. And an announcer came on the radio and said this, We now join the complete red and blue networks for a special program originating in New York City. And that man introduced a speaker. He was supposedly a well-known preacher from New York City, but he was known for being very, very liberal. And he greeted his radio audience with these words, Good morning, it's Easter. You know, folks, it really doesn't make any difference to me if Christ be risen or not. As far as I'm concerned, his body could be as dust in some Palestinian tomb. The main thing is his truth goes marching on. 
Well, listen, Alfred Ackley heard that, and he just got a fuming in his heart. He said, it's a lie. Why, why? And his wife came in and said, why are you shouting like that? He said, that preacher's lying on that radio station. And boy, he was mad, and he went to his church that morning, Sunday morning and Sunday night, and both messages he talked about the proof of the resurrection. But even after that day, and after he preached those wonderful, wonderful truths, boy, he was still in his heart, he was just upset. And his wife said, listen, said, you need, to, you need to kind of get over this. She said, why don't you do this? Why don't you write a song? And if you could just write a song about the resurrection, then that would be something that would last and something that you could keep going to and showing the proof and understanding of the resurrection. And so he took the challenge and he went into his study and he opened up the scriptures and he looked at Mark 16, 6 and he read it. He is risen. He is not here. And as he read it and as he meditated, joy began to flood his heart and he began to think of the reality of a living Christ. He picked up his pen and he began to write these words. I serve a risen Savior He's in the world today. I know that he is living, whatever men may say. I see his hand of mercy. I hear his voice of cheer. And just the time I need him, he's always near. He lives. He lives. Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. Uh, uh, he, you ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. Hey, my friend. That's the greatest proof, isn't it really? Uh, that he lives in your heart. That you know he lives in your heart. That you know he's a living Christ in your life. And as far as I'm concerned, that's the greatest proof of all. That he came into your life and he changed your life. So we see in the blessedness of Easter a loving Christ. We see a, praise God, a living Christ. But then the last thing, and for somebody listening, this may be the most important one of all, we see a saving Christ, a saving Christ. Would you go look at Acts 17 again, verse 3? I know we've read it several times, but boy, I never get tired of reading it. Notice what he says, opening and alleging. Notice that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus, whom I preached unto you, is Christ. Did you get that? Is Christ. See, Paul preached Jesus to them, but he showed them that he was the Christ. The word Christ means Messiah. The word Christ means that he is Savior. So we have to believe when Paul alleged, opened and alleged, he preached to them about getting saved. He preached to them about making this loving and living Savior, their Savior, saving them. And I believe we can definitely assume that because if you look at verse number four, notice what it says, and some of them, what? Believed and consorted with Paul and Silas. Means they believed and they started spending time with Paul and Silas and they got closer to him. And of the devout Greeks, a great multitude got saved. And of the chief women, not a few. So we see he's a saving Christ. That's the blessedness of East. It's not just something to preach about. It's not just something to sing about. It's something to preach about. Why? Because he came to seek and to save that which was lost. And that's all of us, friend. All of us are lost. All of us are sinners. All of us need the Savior. But I want you to notice not everyone believed. Not everyone believed. I would, I would wish that everybody who hears this message that isn't saved would believe, but not everybody believes, unfortunately. Look at verse 5. But the Jews, notice, which believed not, moved with envy and took of them certain lewd fellows of the baser sword. There were some that believed and there were some that didn't believe. I wonder, have you received Jesus Christ as your Savior? Or are you in that verse, verse number five, or have you rejected Jesus as your Savior? Can I tell you this morning, he longs to save you. He longs to come into your life. 
He longs to give to you the gift of eternal life and save you from hell and save you for heaven. He longs to do that. I love this story. I couldn't wait to get to this one story right here. Back years ago, the school, university, a University of Chicago Divinity School would have at once a year a Baptist day. A and on that day, they would invite a speaker. Now, it wasn't always a speaker that would be a preacher. Now, for the life of me, I have no idea why they did this, and I'd love to find out why. But the speaker they brought was a man named Dr. Paul Tillich. And this man stood for an hour and a half and talked about why the resurrection was not true. And he spoke and he spoke and he gave all these reasons why. Why he believed, and he actually said why this, this thing of the resurrection is a bunch of mumbo jumbo. He said why there's no credibility for Christianity. And they sat there, they say there were close to a thousand students that were there, people there, listening to this man. And after it was all done, he actually said, he asked if there were any questions. I wish I would have been there. But thank God there was a preacher there. He's an old preacher, hoary-headed preacher, silver-haired preacher. And he got up in the back of that auditorium that day, and he said, Dr. Tillich, I got one question. And as he said that question, or as he said those words, he reached to a bag and he took out an apple. And he took a bite out of that apple. And he began to chew on that apple. He said, Dr. Tillich, and then he took another bite and he chewed on it. He said, my question is a simple question, and he took another bite and he chewed on it. So I said, now I ain't never read them books you read. And he began to chew on that apple some more. And I can't recite the scriptures in the original Greek like you can. And he took another bite of that apple, and he kept on crunching and munching. And then he said, he said, I don't know nothing about Niebuhr or Hedda Geiger. These are uh, people that he quoted about the fact that the resurrection wasn't true. And he took another bite of that thing. And this time he finished the apple and he had just a core. And then he looked at Dr. Tillich. And he said, Dr. Tillich, he says, all I want to know is this apple I just ate, was it bitter or sweet? And Dr. Tillich paused for a moment and answered in, in an exemplary, scholarly fashion and said, I cannot possibly answer that question for I haven't tasted your apple. And to that, the old preacher, white-haired preacher, dropped the core of the apple, crumpled up the paper bag, looked at Dr. Tillich and said calmly, neither have you tasted my Jesus. And can I tell you, there are those of you that are listening to this message right now, you know that Jesus saved because you tasted Jesus. You know that he forgives because you've already tasted Jesus. You know that he gives eternal life because you've already tasted him. You know that he changes your life because you've already tasted him. You know that he can give you happiness and joy and peace greater than anything else in this world because you've already tasted Jesus Christ in your life. You know that he is a loving Savior. You know that he is a living Savior. And you know that he is a saving Savior. And there are some of you out there, maybe, quite possibly, you don't know that because you've never tasted. You say, why do you keep saying the tasted? I love that verse in the book of Psalms. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. May 6, 1979. Prior to that, two years before that, I knew nothing about the Bible. I knew nothing about Jesus, really. And on that day, May 6, I tasted. I received Jesus as my Savior. I trusted him once and for all as the only one who can take me to heaven. And so I say to you again, Easter is a blessed day because it reminds us that we have a loving Savior, that we have a living Savior but we also have a saving Savior. What a wonderful day this is. What a blessed day this is. We ought to rejoice. Now, I know every Sunday's Resurrection Sunday, and to that I totally agree, but there's just something about that one day that we just focus on this thing. It just thrills my soul. 
just thrills my soul. Try, quite frankly, right now as I'm preaching, I haven't got a care in the world. Got, got, I mean, I know he is alive. You say, have you ever doubted? I gotta, I'll be honest with you. Sometimes I doubt things, sure. But man, if I ever get to the place where I'm doubting anything about the Bible or God, you know what I go to? Go to the resurrection. I go to the, I go to the empty tomb. Now, I don't go there physically. I go there in my mind. I go there in my heart. I go there in the Word of God. I go there in history. And I look into that tomb, and I see that he's not in that tomb. He is alive. I serve a risen Savior. Oh, could I just add one more thing? Look at verse number 6. What, look what happened. Look at, and when they found them not, of course, they were looking for Paul, and Paul and them had already left. When they found them not, it says, they drew Jason, who was saved, and certain brethren under the rulers of the city, crying, listen to this, these that have turned the world upside down are come hither also. You know what the result of a resurrected Savior should be in our life? That we have such zeal, such excitement, such desire that we don't have to go up necessarily. We do need to preach it, but we go out and people see the change in our life and we begin to talk about Jesus that literally we turn the world upside down. Now, I think it's the exact opposite. We're actually turning it upside right. We're, we're, we're trying to put this world where it needs to be. And all I'm saying is, boy, let the resurrection flood your soul. Let the resurrection change your heart. Let the resurrection change the way that you think and ultimately change the way that you live. Would you decide from this day forward that you're going to live like there's a risen Savior, that you're going to live like he lives in you? Man, what a wonderful day today. God bless you. I hope you have a great Sunday. I hope that you'll think about it and, and, and enjoy the fact that you're saved. And if you're not saved, I hope you'll do that. Would you do that? Would you trust him today? Would you make him your Savior? This coming month, May 6th, I'm going to be 42 years old. Now, I know you think that's my physical age by looking at me, but it's just not true. It's spiritual. That's my spiritual birthday, May 6th. I will be 42 years old. And what a blessed 42 years that it's been. May it be blessed for you because of this Easter. God bless you. Have a great afternoon.